Okay. Uh, Recording in progress. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Devlin. Welcome to the Aging in Place Workgroup Financial and Legal Barriers Subgroup. I am one of the chairs, and I'm from the Division of Services for Aging and Adults with Physical Disabilities. And my other chair is Representative Krista Griffith. And um, we'll do quick introductions. I know most of us know each other, but because we're live streaming, let's do some quick introductions. Um, so uh, Representative Griffith, if you wanna go first and then we'll go around. Okay, thank you. So what we'll do is um, I'll, I'll introduce myself, call the next person, and then we'll have the next person uh, introduced and call the following person until we make our way around. Um, Krista Griffith, I'm co-chair of this uh, working group. Um, happy to be here with everybody in our work looking at le uh, legal and financial barriers. I am a state representative for the 12th District of Delaware, and I'd like to uh, turn it over to Olga Bestgrown. Olga? Good morning, Olga Beskron from the Community Legal Aid Society Elder Law Program. I'm the supervising attorney there. Uh, Jamie. Hi, good morning. My name is Jamie Ramage. I'm the owner of Comfort Keepers, which is a home health aid only agency in Delaware. And I'm also on this uh, group representing DOC, which stands for the Delaware Association for Home and Community Care, of which I'm the, the president of the board of that association. And I'm gonna go to Jerry. Good morning, um, Jerry Hanselman, a retired resident in North Wilmington, topic that meets my personal interests. And I'll hand it over to Catherine. Hello, I'm Catherine Reed. I'm an attorney at Estate and Elder Law Services of Delaware. Um, I'm an elder law attorney. I practice with William Earhart, who is also a, a member of this group who has a client meeting at this time, so couldn't join us. Um, we're committed to serving the elderly and the disabled and their families. I'll turn it over to Amy Milligan. Could you please unmute Amy? Sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. You'd think after two and a half years of pandemic virtual, I'd be a little better, but I seem to be getting worse. Anyway, Amy Milligan, I'm the executive director of St. Francis Life, which is a PACE program, which stands for um, Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. It's a, um, a program for, um, to try to maintain elders in the community. Um, and we partner with the state as well as Medicare. Um, I also am representing the uh, Delaware Hospital Association, um, recognizing that a big part of who they service is, is the elderly as well. Kim Roman, would you like to go next? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sure. Um, good morning. I'm Kim Roman. I am the Director of Care Transitions and Business Development for Christiana Care Home Health, and I oversee the flow of patients um, from the hospitals and our external referral sources into home health care. Um, we do service um, over 1,500 patients statewide, so we do get to touch a lot of lives along the way, and um, we do support the hospital initiatives in the accountable care and our primary care practices. So again, a resource to all of those entities within the healthcare system. Uh, Robin? Hi, I'm Robin Mooney. I own Carbe Vita Home Care, which is a um, aid-only non-medical um, in-home care agency that services Kent and Newcastle County. Melissa? Hi, good morning. Melissa Smith, Director of the Division of Services for Aging and Adults with Physical Disabilities. Thank you. Lisa? Mm 
Uh, Lisa, you're on mute, and I'm not sure because you're calling in if you can unmute yourself. There she is. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Okay, good morning. It's Lisa Zimmerman, Medicaid Deputy Director, and I'm sorry I'm operating with half a voice today. <laughs> no problem. And Denise. Denise Robinson. I'm a nurse supervisor with the Division of Medicaid and Medical Assistance. Okay, so thank you. I think we got everybody that's on the call and Michael Sheridan is also on the call who is our house staff. So um, thank you all for introducing yourselves. And I think our first course of business for the agenda is to approve the minutes from the last meeting. Has everybody had a chance to review them? Okay, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? I approve them, Amy, approve Amy. them. Second? I'll second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, Aye. the minutes are approved. Um, so um, Representative Griffith, I didn't know if you wanted me to go through the data requests first or do you wanna talk about the goals first? So I think, and my apologies, um, Julie, I, for not putting that data. Julie was there very quick. Um, APS was very quick in getting data back for us that we had requested with that wonderful presentation at last meeting. So I was going to let Julie, Julie, why don't you do that presentation? And then you and I can go into the discussion. We want to start getting our work together in terms of our focus for the final, uh, what our final goals will be. So please, uh, please take it, uh, uh, take it away, Julie, on those, uh, that data request. Thank you. Not a problem. So I'm going to take a, uh, Keep this high level and Melissa, feel free to jump in because um, Melissa's obviously seen the data as well. And thanks to our wonderful data team for pulling it so quickly. It was not me. <laughs> so, um, And Michelle, unfortunately, could not be here this time. And so that is why I'm going to go over the data. And we'll share this with everybody after the meeting. But um, so I'm just going to look at my other screen here. So I apologize. So in the last year... Uh, we received, so Adult Protective Services received just over 2,600 reports of abuse, neglect, and um, exploitation. And that includes caregiver neglect, financial exploitation, physical, verbal, sexual abuse, um, and uh, other types of abuses not defined. We don't currently do within Adult Protective Services, as we discussed at the last meeting, uh, self-neglect, which is inadequate self-care. But our agency, Division of Services for Aging and Adults with Physical Disabilities, DSAPIT, does respond to people who are providing inadequate self-care. That's just a different part of our house. Our community nurses and our case managers respond to that. You'll see a law change in the coming months uh, where APS will be the ones responding to self-neglect. So our numbers don't have self-neglect in them. We imagine it'll rise significantly in the future when they do have that. So of the 2,600 cases or complaints that were reported to Adult Protective Services, um, APS went out and saw just over 2,000 of those. So a pretty large percentage of cases. And usually they don't go out um, to homes when it's just not appropriate. It's not abuse, neglect, exploitation. It was self-neglect and so it's referred somewhere else. Anytime they decide not they, when the agency decides it's not appropriate for adult protective services, they refer the individual somewhere else. So they're not just saying, you know, not appropriate, goodbye. It's either referred to our case managers, our nurses, or another service that's needed um, in the community. So we really focused at our last meeting on financial exploitation. So I'll dig into that a little bit. Um, of the 2,600 case reports that came in, um, 1,271 of them were financial exploitation. So a good chunk of the cases that we're getting are financial exploitation, um, followed by followed by caregiver neglect. And we definitely saw a decrease in caregiver neglect from 2020 to 2021. And we believe that's because of the pandemic. Uh, caregivers weren't necessarily going to their loved ones' homes as much or people weren't seeing the neglect up front. And so um, that was a lot of it. People weren't going into the home, whether it be a, a home health agency or something like that as much as they would have pre-pandemic. And so we're starting to see that in our numbers. 
And hey, Julie, Julie yeah. this is Amy. I missed it. How many cases for um, caregiver neglect? So we had, um, now of course, I lost it on my screen. Hold on a second. All okay. Right. No, no, you're fine. It was my fault. Okay, so just over 500 cases of okay. caregiver neglect. Were yeah, reported. so most likely, most likely not a decline, just not reported because we didn't have much access to the elderly. Yeah, and when we look at the trend, and you'll see this when we send out when we send out the information, we have been going on an upward trend of complaints and uh, so reports as well as our going out to the home uh, or to the community to investigate them. And it kind of, it's still pretty high, but it's it tapered down a little bit in 2021. And that's because of okay. the pandemic. And we're seeing that yeah. really. We imagine that um, hopefully the pandemic is letting up a little bit and our numbers are going to rise significantly, we believe, um, in the coming year. So for financial exploitation, um, we have a year-by-year -year breakdown of our cases that you'll see of substantiated versus non-substantiated. And on the last call, Michelle talked about what that meant. That's if we had enough evidence to say, yes, financial exploitation happened versus no, we're not really sure if it happened or it definitely did not happen based on the report. And so I'm just looking at the numbers. So for financial exploitation, um, of the financial exploitation cases for the last five years, a majority of them, it looks like were substantiated. So we had about two, in the last five years, we had two, just 3,000 cases were substantiated and then not much different were unsubstantiated, meaning that it was probably a scam and we couldn't find enough evidence to say, yes, this definitely happened. A mm -hmm. lot of the cases that financial exploitation, um, that's our, where we don't know the perpetrator. So it's a scam from another country. It's, you know, those grandparent scams, help grandmom, um, you know, I'm in jail, send a gift card so I can get out of prison. Um, those kind of scams that you hear on the news, we get a lot of those. And especially during COVID, we've seen an uptick in the scams. Um, we also, in general, um, in 2021, out of all of the, the cases we investigated, uh, 1,390 were unsubstantiated and 800 were substantiated. So we're finding that it is hard. It's sometimes hard to substantiate and said this definitely happened, especially because APS is a voluntary service, mm -hmm. though it's mandated reporting. And so we might have an uncooperative victim or someone, you know, if it's a caregiver, they might not want to say anything terrible about their caregiver because that's the person providing them the only care that they're getting. And so yeah. a lot of what APS and our investigators do is a lot of, um, psychological work, I would say, with the families as well as with the with the alleged victim, because we want them to get the care that they need. And we also have, and you'll see this in the data that I send, sent out, a breakdown of unsubstantiated and substantiated based on allegation type. And that's from 2017 to 2021, which was five years that uh, we have data for. And Again, financial exploitation is our largest, and it also has the most amount of substantiated cases. Julie, do you guys track um, type uh, the sources that you get them from? The the you know, like because I don't know, Jamie, if you're having an issue, we saw in 2021 some um, some of our participants were saying that. Uh, uh, a home health aide or somebody had taken something and they weren't substantiated, but it seems like because, I don't know if it was COVID, but a lot more people locally were in and out of their house, like in their apartment complex. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know if you heard, if Jamie, if you had, had any more accusations of that, but we've not, not had it in, ye I mean, literally since the beginning. And we had probably two last year, two or three. Um, I, it, well, it's funny, I, Amy, I was trying to wrap my head around because the, you know, the statement was that caregiver neglect was down. Yeah. And so 
and 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 it was like we're crediting COVID for that. But I don't. I actually, it, I think it's the opposite. So I'm 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 struggling. I'm having no. a hard time. So let me let me. So caregiver would be unpaid. Like caregiver. that's family. Yeah, it so, wouldn't be. It wouldn't be what home care does. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so the definition for caregiver neglect is it's just the familial or the friend caregiver unpaid, and we classify um, home health aides or something like that as as a different type of neglect or abuse. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, so we, and we do track uh, the type of perpetrator, and I'll get to that information. Okay. We do that. Um, and we also are tracking who is reporting to us. So if it's a family member, neighbor, um, an agency that sees something, we do track that as well. I don't have that information um, in front of me though. Yeah, I, I just think, unfortunately, I think the numbers are grossly understated. Oh, they are. Because of COVID. I mean, I can't tell you how many clients we have gone out to over the past year that they're, their family caregivers did not go in the house. They would visit mom and dad outside or from the window and they had no clue what was going on inside that house. Yeah. And the, you know, the status of the, of, of the house itself, the, the clothes, the food, you name it. Yeah. And I think that's exactly right. And I think even pre COVID, it was like that as well. We are not we don't always get the reports that that we think that we should. And, um, you know, sometimes our agency has a different type of touch point with them. And then we see, just like you all see, that they really do need the help and that we need to be helping or providing more aggressive supports for the individuals. And so um, and I think that's what we were talking about. Like, do people know the phone number and things like that? And like, you have to call that you're mandated. That's part of the outreach and communication that we've been talking about this whole time. So in terms of if the perpetrator was named, um, a lot of the time when a perpetrator is named, it is a relative. Um, and um, I'm just looking if we have it broken down for financial exploitation. Yes, we do. Okay. So about uh, for financial exploitation specifically, 30% um, of the time, almost 31% of the, the time, um, it is no, no one is named and that's specific to financial exploitation. Um, and then around 27% of the time it is a named person. And I think as opposed to the other allegations where a lot of the time it is a relative for financial exploitation because of the scams that we see, that is why we have no named perpetrator. And a lot of the time the reporting source is a bank that is flagging it because they are required oh. by law to flag the financial exploitation. And they have a specific form that they fill out and send to uh, Department of Justice and to us because then it becomes a criminal matter as well. And so it's a dual process. Um, but for the other cases, a majority of the time it is a relative or um, someone that they know, um, whether it be a neighbor, a family member, uh, a friend. Um, when it's not financial exploitation, a majority of the cases they know who it is. So that is the data that was requested of us. Do I have any questions? So uh, I know I wouldn't. So of the 27% that were named persons, mm -hmm. who, who made the phone call? It's usually, it can be the bank. Yeah, because so the bank, or, a lot of times, or it could be another sibling. If it's a sibling, okay. um, who is taking the money and another sibling said, that's my inheritance. You know, we have across the board, you can probably think of all the different scenarios that happen. Um, but um, a lot of the times we're hearing it from the banks first because they're noticing like a huge withdrawal of money or something fishy going on. Um, and so they're required to let adult protective services know. If it's something like I had jewelry in this drawer and it's not there anymore. Is that considered financial? Uh, no, it's not. Financial is monetary only, yeah. Uh, only monetary, okay. They took my ATM card and said they were going to get me groceries, but they ended up keeping it and getting gas and everything else. 
Yeah, and we do get those. I mean, we have those kind of cases all the time. And I can't speak for Adult Protective Services because I'm not in it, but I have heard those kind of stories. And even if it doesn't rise to the level of Adult Protective Services, again, we will support the individual and try to figure out how to help them. Um, it, it could just be a family dispute, you know, and sometimes right. it's with that. And we don't want it to rise to the level where Adult Protective Services has to intervene. So, uh, Olga? Yes, um, I just wanted to know from, uh, not necessarily uh, you, you, Julie, but from the caregivers, the professional caregivers, when uh, you have a family member who wants to assist or a close friend who wants to assist a, uh, a client, um, I'm just wondering if people are recommending that joint bank accounts be entered into uh, or if you're encouraging people to avoid the joint bank account scenario and to do a power of attorney because maybe um, Catherine Reed can speak to this also, but our advice is always do not do the bank joint bank account. Please don't do that because you're giving your money away to somebody. Um, and that can be a big problem in many different ways. And that if you do a power of attorney, you get the, you get the same result. Uh, somebody has access to, to your accounts to be able to help you, but but they have a duty that that they don't otherwise have in a joint checking account. They have what they call a fiduciary duty to to act in your best interest. Um, and so we see a lot of cases where people put uh, somebody's name on a joint bank account and we have to deal with the problem of, well, you've just given them your money um, legally. Uh, whereas if it's just a power of attorney, they're not turning over title. So. I know I can speak from my experience, Olga, that we ask for um, power of attorney when we are bringing on a new client um, from the perspective of we often talk to both the medical <clears throat> POA to get that medical history and most recent updates. But then there's a financial POA who signs the paperwork um, for the payment agreement portion of services. But so you know, I, I don't legally. specifically ask anything or say anything about a, a joint bank account. So th that's something, th thank you for raising that flag for me. Yes, we do We do powers of attorney uh, for free um, for people who are 60 or over. So um, you can send people our way. Where are, where are you again? I'm so sorry. For the Community Legal Aid Society, the Elder Law Program. Thank and, you. And uh, I can put our contact information into the into the notes, I guess, or into the chat. Uh, All right, thank you. Into the chat. Okay. And Carly. Well, I'll respond to Olga first um, before I get to my question. Olga said it perfectly. I agree with everything she said. Nothing to add on that. Um, related point is it highlights the need for education of the public. And this is an easy thing to tell people or to stick in a brochure or on a billboard. This is not like a long, <laughs> complicated legal analysis. It's a simple message. Don't add people joint to your bank account, period. Get a power of attorney. Um, it also ties in as part of that education message like Bill talks about at the beginning, and I did too, a general failure of people to plan. Um, there needs to be an overall message about incapacity management not passing on of your wealth when you die. Everything we're talking about here is what's happening to these poor souls while they're alive. So um, it, it needs to be an education point. Um, and um, Olga, a quick question for you is, um, since you didn't say there's a financial qualification, I assume there isn't one, but can you just confirm that it's, a millionaire could come to you and get a free, durable, personal power of attorney. That's true. But what I would tell that millionaire is that we don't do estate planning and that they better call Catherine Reed. <laughs> okay. 
Well, it's, we get yeah. a lot of, that's great to know. Um, um, okay, so my question for Julie was, please forgive me if you already said this, but is the financial exploitation number for 2021 up from a prior year? Let me just look, it's actually down. Um, so it's down by around 250 reports. Um, and we've been, it's gone up and down. Um, and it, so it hasn't been a linear straight up. So in 2018, it was, it was our highest ever at 1600. And I think, um, it's, it was the highest then because we did a marketing campaign around financial exploitation at that time. Um, and so we also believe that all of our numbers are going to go up because this summer we're going to be doing a full out marketing campaign with billboards, hopefully, um, as well, um, and education as part of uh, some grant activity that we have. So um, we find it's very much tied to how much we advertise it because people don't always remember adult protective services is available. Um, thank you. One last point on that. Uh, the stick is greater than the, I forget what the saying is, but if people are afraid that they're going to get caught when they're um, buying groceries for grandma, but extra taking out an extra hundred dollars, they might not do that. So um, even just the threat of monitoring or something would be great to include in that billboard. Okay. Thank you. We're always open to suggestions of what to include. So do you have any more, please feel free to send them to us because we are not the experts in marketing will be hiring experts in marketing, but um, we definitely want to make sure that people all over the state see it at um, all different levels because especially financial exploitation can happen to anybody. So, and Representative Griffith, your hands are raised. Thank you, Julie, and thanks for um, reviewing those numbers and thanks for all the questions. Kylie, you had a question, a great point about, you know, education, education, education. We really do need to do better as a state. Uh, do you have any ideas specifically, you know, in terms of the legal realm? I'm wondering what you and Olga are thinking in terms of how can we do better to educate our um, seniors about their rights um, legally? Um, have you? Because I think, you know, as we're going to move on to the next part of our agenda, um, and I do want to make sure we close the loop on if anybody has any additional questions for Julie relative to the data, but as we're moving under that next part of our draft considerations, um, you know, I do think education's key. And I'm wondering, um, based on your, your um, combined expertise in the legal realm, um, what, what thoughts you might have. Um, so, but before we get to that, I just want to pause to make sure we close the loop on the data. Does anybody else have any questions for Julie relative to the data? No, but thanks to Julie. And also please do give Michelle our regards because that presentation from the last meeting was, was really helpful. It was really helpful. All right, so, so let's go on to the next part of our agenda, which is draft recommendation discussion. We have a few months to work, but I do think it's always better to start these draft recommendations sooner than later. That way we can fine tune them and make them as um, specific and helpful as opposed to nebulous and non-specific, um, and that we can really actually have some um, uh, some real effective action with some of our recommendations. So uh, I think uh, Kylie, you you you, is, you really hit it on the head with that education piece. So to you and to Olga, what what can we do better? Um, and uh, you know, uh, uh, looking at that future draft recommendation and seeing that education will be a primary part of that. What are some specific and general things that you think in your expertise that we can do better as a state to get the word out to seniors about um, planning for their future and avoiding, um, you know, avoiding um, terrible situations like fraud and exploitation? You can give the elder law more money so that we can hire more people. Um, I will, my, our director is on, on it. And so we'll take that under advisement. <laughs> we heard it. <laughs> Olga, did you have anything else to say? I don't want to. Um... No, 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 no. Uh, please take, take the baton. 
This is a thought just off the top of my head. I would like to reflect better and more deeply, but we need to reach people where they are. As that saying goes, you hear that a lot on TV or in writing now, but it's true. Um, you know, we have the legal handbook for older Delawareans. How many people are reading that? How many people are even getting that? A lot of elderly are isolated. They're not going to the senior center. They're, they're, where are they going? They're going to the doctor. They're going to the hairdresser. They're going to the grocery store, maybe. Um, but they're in a car driving there. Somebody's taking them. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is um, a focus of the education needs to be the method of reaching them. Um, may, uh, they're not online really for emails all that much. Um, I mean, I'm only half joking about the billboards, but that is something people see. And, um, you know, I know paper is very expensive to print anything out that way, but um, we should give thought to how we were going to reach people to get the message out. We think about the vote at voting time, right? We have read, we have, um, I'm going to use the wrong words, but you know, lists of ages of people and we send them out stuff on how to vote. You know, um, what would be so horrible about sending them out a one sheet resource paper on how to protect themselves? If this is happening to you, this is wrong. And this is who you should call. And you won't be harmed if you call. You know, you can do it anonymously or whatever. Um, and include a few bullet points about maybe you don't say never do a joint account, but educate them. Powers of attorney are available for free through the state. That is a much better protective device than a joint account. Thank you. That's excellent. Um, what, um, and then Amy? I was just thinking similar to what you were saying is that because doctor's offices um, and church are places that I think the elderly keep going, um, then I think, you know, there could be a case for doing some type of um, either brochure, information sheet, or something even for providers in a, in a primary care office, because they are the ones that the elderly will continue to go to. And it is within their um, framework um, to make sure related to um, their patient safety. So I think maybe a little campaign in the local primary cares, um, whether it would be a brochure or a letter with, you know, the top five things we want them to know, um, whether it goes to the office manager or, you know, a PA, NP, nurse or whatever, that, that might be a way because they do go there if they go anywhere. And then of course you could, you could do my population, the ERs, and then churches too. What can we do in churches? I'm, I'm sure it is very hard now because people aren't doing, you know, we used to have programs where you would come in because we had a large audience that would come into our day center. Of course, that's not the case now, but it will happen again. But I think, and I'm sure you guys have tried this, like magnets on the refrigerator some way. I mean, going into senior housing and giving them out, you know, that kind of thing. So it is hard right now. But I think to your point, we go to the places we know they will go. And for me, it would be primary care physicians or churches and maybe grocery stores. But, you know, doing something more targeted because billboard and billboards are a good idea, but the billboards would probably, at least my population would be more for the caregivers. Um, but Everything we want our people to know about when to call the ER, when to call us, what's dangerous, all that stuff, it's on the refrigerator. Um, so I think that um, giving primary care some of the, you know, some of the um, responsibility and information to have those discussions in some kind of campaign, I think would be a really good idea. I have a physical coming up tomorrow 
And I filled out my physical form this morning and there's nothing on my physical form. They wanna know about every ache and pain I have, but there's no education on there. Uh, and, and another thing, a bulletin board, I don't look at them. They go by too quickly. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the road. Um, I don't drive as much anymore. So I'm pretty tuned into the road. Now tomorrow, when I go in for my physical, I will be sitting in that room probably 15 minutes waiting for someone to come in. Perfect time. Yep. So I'm thinking if if there are like posters issued and asking physicians to put them on their treatment room walls, I would probably sit there and read it as I'm sitting there waiting. So I you have a captive audience of someone in a dressing gown waiting, whether it's to see your gynecologist or your cancer specialist. I know that um, for abuse, spousal abuse or relationship abuse, I did see quite a few of those posters go up in bathrooms in every physician's office over the last five years. And I think those had a big impact. So that's a, a window of time that I could like, I'm, there's not much else to look at, you know, as I'm sitting there waiting. So it's a thought. I think Kim and both, I think Kim is next, unless Jamie, you are, have more to add. The only thing I would add to what that they just shared was um, as home care providers, we need to provide um, our, our prospective clients with an emergency preparedness um, packet or pamphlet, if you will. And I think, what, what was it called? Um, the buddy, buddy something. I was just going to suggest the buddy from uh, the Division of Public Health. which is Yes. Good. Yeah. But I think, Julie, part of it is, is like, I don't think it was mandated that we had to use that form. Like we could come up with our own um, to which, you know, there's a lot. So there's a lot of information provided during that initial assessment. Um, so, it, you know, I, in some senses, I'm hesitant to add more to it just because I think it can get lost in the details and it's just overwhelming. But in the same sense, it, it's a packet of information that we leave there in the home. And it, it, if the state wants to put something out consistent, it could be across the board for all home care providers. And the other thing I'll just chime in to say is that the state could do, um, in my opinion, a, a better job of educating um, especially new providers on these topics. There's, you know, for any anybody who wants to start in the agency, a home care agency in the state of Delaware, they have to go to a new provider forum. It is not, it was not mentioned during that new provider forum. Okay. Like, cause I, Robin and I went, um, we wanted to get an additional license. And so we went to that new provider forum and there, there's some critical that you've got, you know, potential new owners of home care agencies, you've got them as a captive audience. Um, they need to be educated. Well, thankfully, uh, the agency that puts that on is one of our sister divisions. And so we can have a conversation with them about including information about abuse, neglect, exploitation, um, legal planning. So yeah, great idea. And Kim, I think you were next. You are on mute. Everybody keeps moving around. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think I'm um, able. Um, I wanted to just um, piggyback on what Amy said about the primary care um, providers. Um, I do know that there are providers that are supported by um, uh, managers outside um, in our population health programs that do have routine remote touch points with um, members um, that are um, considered at risk for other reasons. And um, I can explore some of what their at risk assessments include if they touch on this because they may be a resource as well because they are already um, touching a lot of lives that are being cared for under these primary care practices. 
um, and the, those providers consist of um, nurse case managers and social workers. So they are they are touching a lot of lives statewide, and I think most of the health systems are covered by a consistent provider. Kylie? To reinforce what everyone said, um, definitely a home health agency, when they meet with the client to start, should hand it as a brochure. Two, um, post the PDF of this brochure on a website that makes sense. Um, in my line of work, I refer to the, there's a, um, at the Newcastle County Register of Wills, they have a short pamphlet. It's like a trifold each side and it's posted, or at least it was last time I looked. It's just really nice um, to be able to send people to that. Um, and the third point is um, the, the importance of the message going to people who have money and the people who don't have money, because it's everyone who's impacted. Thank you. Amy? Uh, based on what everybody's saying, I just had this idea, and I don't know if this is, I mean, this would be a really heavy lift. But wouldn't it be great if we get, could get the, to have the ACOs have a portion of their, you know, they're working to decrease costs and risks and they, and they get motivated by that, that we would have some section. Cause I remember all the, you know, the, the physical exams as our kids get older, there was a time where there was absolutely on that questionnaire, a part about you know, has anybody abused you, you know, that kind of stuff. So if we could somehow put it as part of the thing, whether in we update the questionnaire or, and I don't know, Lisa, from your pers uh, perspective at the state, I don't know if that's an insurance thing, but if we continue to grow ACOs, which we are, and the benefit is to decrease um, health concerns for everybody, um, that is a key issue of elder care. Um, that might be a heavy lift, but, you know, for Delaware to get someplace like that, that part of what our ACOs were doing was a tiny little section, because you have sections on, the, the physician does have a section on how you're feeling um, uh, from a mental health perspective. To me, that would be a subset of that. So I don't know how it would be done yeah. or if it could. I mean, I think it, it's, it's Lisa, Amy, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so let's just just because I know the meeting is being recorded, I just need to clarify it's MCO, not ACO. Yes, so yes, it's managed MCO. care organization. Sorry, I'm sorry, I just want to click because there's there are ACOs, but but that's a different animal. So just want to make that clarification. We um, could probably do both. So right. <laughs> so um I think that you know there are certain we're certainly open to discussion to make this better. I'm I'm uh, aware I think you're referring to the expert. Um, questionnaire that happens when people go to the PCP. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm aware that we pay for the expert questionnaire um, when folks, when physicians and, and nurses and so on fill that out. In terms of where the uh, questions come from on the expert, I'm not 100% sure that would take a little bit of research to figure that out, but I'm sure that we can. Um, but I know that the MCOs do um, a health risk assessment every time they get a new client. Um, and certainly those kinds of questions, I, I would venture to guess are embedded in there. And that's another thing that we can take away. Denise will help me remember these things um, to make sure that we take that away and look at what's in, what's in that health risk assessment that we're asking up front. But then in an ongoing way, as people go to the PCP, how do we get that um, question asked and answered? Um, I think are things we can sort of take away and work on if, if that makes people happy. That would be great to see the health risk assessment because I can't, I, I would suspect in some ways there's, um, you know, even a lot of employers do health risk assessments, um, but we're dealing probably with the mostly retired population, but that sounds like a a good start because then we could see if there's something in there that at least starts the question. And I can see the nurse who's doing the, the vitals or whatever, even doing that little part when somebody goes into the, into the exam room. 
Right. We can take that away. I wasn't trying to make you guys do it, Lisa. I just wondered what the connection might have been. Oh, or if no, there no, is not one. at all. Happy. Listen, very committed to the work and the mission here. Happy to follow up. Don't, please don't feel like you're giving me assignment. Happy to do that. Uh, Jerry, you have your hand raised. Yes, um, this might be far-fetched, but an idea that comes to me is how many medications uh, people of that age get. I don't know if something could be done with the pharmacies in Delaware where um, some kind of note could be attached to a receipt and that buried. Some, I don't know if an education campaign has ever been done that way. That would be something that the patient, the individuals might see or the caretakers um, educating both, um, helping people who might abuse not, not get in trouble. Um, but it's something it's touched all the time. Um, it, there's quite a bit. And I don't know if that industry would be interested in helping. And I'm glad that you brought that up because in one of our, um, in, on our other side of the house where we were working on dementia resources. And that's actually one of the ideas that we had was putting something about dementia in people's pharmacy bags related to if they get to any kind of medication to help with dementia. Um, and so we were working with the Alzheimer's Association with it. So I can reach back out to our contact with the Alzheimer's Association to see, you know, how they were able to get that done um, and see if we can do something along those lines. Great. Um, there was one thing I was thinking about, um, and this has all been helpful. So I think we have enough uh, basis to go ahead and start a draft for that education piece. So I'll uh, take a, I'll take a crack at that and submit it to the team um, before our next meeting for everybody to look at, add to, cross out, whatever we want to do, but just to get it sort of in, in form. There's one thing that I think we need to hear, uh, and that's the the financial piece. And I, I just, Truthfully, I know Delaware has so many financial advisors um, where whether they're looking at working for themselves, hanging out their own shingle or working for large firms such as Schwab or Fidelity. Um, I think it would be helpful to have an understanding of what's the financial planning landscape for seniors out there. Um, and as someone, I think it was Amy or maybe it was uh, Kim, someone said from all or maybe it was Kylie, those who have no money and those who have a lot of money. Like, What's available for seniors out there just on a level playing field to get basic advice um, and to know that they're not being um, swindled, if you will, or having to pay a lot of fees. So I think that would be helpful if everyone could buy show of hands for our next presentation for next meeting. If I could find someone to sort of give a presentation on that, would, would that be helpful? If, if so, could any and those raise their hands if they'd like to see that? Okay, great. All right, so I'll try to arrange that. And if anybody has any ideas, please send me an email as to who might do a good job with that. Please do send me an email and I'll follow up with him or her. Um, and is there anything else um, in terms of that education piece that anybody wanted to add? I know Julie has a hard stop at noon. So if we're all able to stop at noon, I, th I think we could be able to do that because um, we covered a lot of ground today. But the, the date that I was looking at for next meeting um, is February 28th at 11. By show of hands, does that work for everybody? Okay. So um, if we could, Will and Mike, if you could make notation of that and that we will, um, we will, um, uh, have that. Now, Julie, I'll turn the rest of the meeting over to you for public comment and closing comments. <laughs> okay. Um, Will, I don't know if we see any public comments. I don't see any other attendees. Or Mike? Uh, there are no attendees, but just for procedure's sake, if anyone would like to uh, participate in public comment, please use the raise hand function. It's like there's no one who would like to participate in public comment. Uh, if you would like to email me public comments, you can email me at michael.sheridan at delaware.gov. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, I think we can close out our meeting for the day. Um, thank you all for having a wonderful discussion. Yet again, these meetings are always um, 
really fruitful and enlightening for me, I know. Um, and I think for all of us, um, it's been really enjoyable. And we look forward to seeing you on the 28th. And we will be sending out the minutes as well as um, information about how to uh, log on to the meeting as it gets closer. So thank you and have a good day, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Recording stopped.